Good morning. The world's second biggest fleet of ferries is in danger of disruption this holiday weekend, if not an all-out cessation of services, as the 2,700 members of the BC Ferry and Marine Workers Union vote tomorrow, vote counted early Friday morning, by referendum ballot on whether or not to accept the settlement proposed in front of them right now. And in the studios of Czech TV in Victoria, I have Norm Thornber, the manager for labor relations of the BC Ferry Corporations. Mr. Thornber, I have a gut feeling that if it's a pass vote for strike at all, a whole blinking service is going to be closed down one way or the other at the weekend. How do you feel about it? Well, that's uh, a possibility, Jack. The union has indicated that they'll be going into rotating strikes. However, how long that would last and is anyone's guess, this seems to be their strategy at this particular time. If they go into, and they likely will, rotating strikes, will you close down the entire system or will you and the public merely suffer the disruption between here and Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands? Well, there's been no decision made as to whether we should, in effect, lock out. That's a policy decision that's beyond my jurisdiction. That decision would be made by the board of directors or the cabinet or someone considerably above my level. On the actual settlement offered, is this settlement, in fact, a parallel in its own way with the agreement reached with the kind of parent body, the B.C. Government Employees Union? It's very close. Uh, the union, all the way through negotiations, indicated that they didn't want to piggyback with the government employees union. And we attempted to accommodate them. We addressed problems that, uh, that were peculiar to the ferry system. Uh, however, uh, we were faced with a situation where uh, we were expected to give not only what the government employees gave, but also uh, additional demands which which we also addressed and I know this, this is hypothetical mr. Thomber but is this your final offer what is our final offer is this your final offer what's on the contract right now our final offer uh, was given when we were meeting with uh, the mediator Fred Geddes and actually uh, the offer, the report McKee made was considerably higher than our final offer. So you've gone beyond, really, what was your final offer? Exactly. Is this a fair settlement? It was a fair settlement when we made the so-called final offer. More detail from Norm Thornber, manager of labor relations for the BC Ferry Corporation from our Czech studios in Victoria after this break. Norm, it's an unfair question, but as a former official of the union, now working for the Ferry Corporation, you got many of the conditions in this contract. Is this as good a contract as there is anywhere in British Columbia in government service? I'm not aware of any that are better or even equal because we did over a period of a number of years uh, improve the conditions and the wages in the ferry fleet to a point where they led rather than uh, lag behind. I think this is a fair position for the ferry employees to be in, I, and I certainly have never attempted to put them in any other than that position. I think their demands right now are a little unrealistic. However, uh, we have made our offer. McKee has made his report, and I there's not too much we can do until we hear the results of the ballot. Okay, the actual settlement is eight, eight, is eight, eight, and two. Is it not eight, eight, and two percent? We'll come to that two percent extension in a moment or two. But I was the first person of British Columbia, probably to your annoyance, who screamed and shouted about the big money for the pie cutters. I think the public is entitled to know now, Mr. Thornber, from you, what the present wages are for some standard jobs on the ferries, unlicensed personnel, what the increases mean, and how much money they will make. Well, if you want some illustrations, for instance, a, a chief engineer is making at this time basic wages. We're not talking about fringe benefits overtime or any of the other provisions. A chief engineer is making $2,570 now. 
on August the 1st, 1980, uh, or he would be, pardon me, he would be making 2570 as of August the 1st, 79. All right. Uh, 2776 in 1980, All right. and 2832 in August the 1st, 1981. In other words, from uh, August the 1st, 1979, he'd be going from $30,000 $840 a year to $33,984. Uh, a dishwasher. His current rate is $1,112. Uh, he'd be going to $1,201 retroactive to August 1st, 1979, to 1297 a year later, and to 1323 and remember, this is for a seven-hour day, paid for seven and a half. Does that include the cost of the fringe benefits? I'm sorry? Does that include the fringe benefit costs? No. What no. are the annual equivalents to that, then, without the fringe benefit costs for, for a dishwasher? Jack, I'm having difficulty hearing you. What are the annual equivalents, uh, uh, annual equivalents for the dishwasher without the fringe benefits, just the cash money? The annual equivalent? Yeah, you gave me the annual equivalents for the chief engineer. What are the annual equivalents for the dishwasher? Oh, I didn't project that, Jack. I'll have to work that out myself. Are the fringe benefits included in the money figures you're giving me? No. What are the fringe benefits? Oh, we haven't worked them out, but I would expect that the fringe benefits would approximate 20%. 20% on top of the cash? Yeah. Now, of course, they get full medical, full dental, Full what? Full medical, full dental, uh, full protection uh, for sickness, uh, both short-term and long-term, which takes them through to retirement, actually, uh, if, they're, if they're incapacitated and can't continue in their job. They have full job, or, uh, job security. We have a no layoff clause after two years regular employment. Uh, I could go on and on, Jack. Uh, they have some 30 provisions in the contract which provides for time off, uh, for legitimate reasons, of course. And uh, I think they have a pretty fair shake. Why do I meet so many ferry workers who are always boasting to me about their three months extra time off in the summer because of overtime? It seems that half the fleet and most of the officers have at least three, if not more. In fact, they complain they can't get their time off, uh, which they want to take in lieu of money, because you are kind of short of staff. Or well, because the conditions of the contract are so generous. Well, it is a generous contract. You, you've stated it correctly. And certainly, when that particular clause was negotiated, uh, by some of us a few years ago, it was with the understanding that time off would be given when uh, qualified help was available. Uh, this was fully understood by the people in the fleet, certainly fully understood by the union, uh, and I'm talking about the optional overtime clause, which you, you can bank your overtime and take time off at a mutually agreeable time with the with a condition that the corporation will provide X amount of uh, time of, uh, to the individual in that current year. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you just carry it over. Yeah, but it is as bad, or it is as good, as you might say, as I project to you just now, that it's not at all uncommon for skippers, chief engineers, ferry workers, because of the unavoidable overtime, to have as much as three or four months off a year with pay because of this generous uh, short working hour contract. Well, certainly they have, would have that accumulated. I'm not in a position to say whether people take that much time off or not. I expect that they do. I, there was one curious little thing which perhaps I shouldn't even raise from the contract. Uh, there's very generous bereavement leave for wide members of the family involved, is there not? Yes, that's correct, Jack. But if I'm on holiday and my granny dies, and even if I don't go to the funeral, uh, or if I'm off on holiday and go to the funeral, I still get an additional five days added to my annual vacation? That's right. My goodness gracious me, that is indeed generous. There is another clause in the contract which worried me a little bit, which seemed to indicate that seniority and not merit is going to take much of the place for promotion in the BC ferries. 
Uh, the employer has agreed to a new appointment policy permitting automatic promotion to a large number of classifications based on qualifications and seniority, with seniority the dominant factor. Have you given up promotions on merit? Up to the supervisory level, Jack. Uh, the supervisory or summary supervisory positions would be filled through competition and certainly would be uh, filled by the most qualified senior people available. In other words, we want to give some incentive to, to the junior people to prepare themselves for promotions, and uh, only those people who have done that, taken the necessary courses and so on, will be promoted. Am well, I twisting a little bit? I thought Article 9 meant that seniority caused the promotions at all levels. No, no, not at all levels at all, Jack, no. Uh, below the supervisory level? Below the semi-supervisory level. Uh -huh. And you've also shortened the probationary period to become a full-time employee. We've eliminated the probationary period altogether and put in a trainee period. Uh, it's still the same time, but it does give us an opportunity to assess the individual better than we would normally. One of the concerns of some ferry workers to whom I have spoken, serious trade unionists among the ferry workers, is that they're very much afraid of your casual policy and that you may be, in effect, be building a casual force, not quite within the union status. Is that correct or false? No, that's absolutely untrue, Jack. What has happened? I mentioned earlier that we have some 30, and I think it's in excess of that, provisions in the contract whereby you can take time off. And as a result of, uh, of our new sick leave plan, which uh, which has increased our absenteeism some 50% in less than a year uh, because of educational leave, union leave, uh, leaves of absence for special uh, leave privileges, bereavement leave, as you just mentioned. All of these things have necessitated the use of casuals. We can't operate without casuals, Jack. We, had, uh, we have... Uh, made arrangements and we have we thought we'd reached agreement with the union on putting in those casuals who have worked 12 months in in the last 15 giving them regular status a regular paycheck uh, full privileges of, or full benefits of the regular employees but apparently they've reintroduced this as a, a, a point still in in dispute I can't understand that particular thing because what we have agreed to do is put some 85 people into regular status uh, situation. Just let me hold you there for a moment. Did you say sick leave has increased 50% in the past year? That's a conservative figure, Jack. By sick leave, you're including paid educational leave? Oh, yeah, there's paid educational leave. There's uh, unpaid educational leave. There's a uh, holiday entitlement. There's uh, over holidays in lieu of overtime. Well, there's time off in lieu of overtime, uh, holidays, uh, regular holidays. There's all kinds of areas where people are taking approximately, legitimately, taking 10% uh, off, which means an increase of 10% the workforce because we're peculiar uh, to the rest of the government service in that if a person is absent, because of Department of Transport regulations, we have to replace them. In other words, we have to have so many people on those vessels in order to continue to sail. So many lifeboat certificates, so many qualified officers, so many uh, qualified seamen, so on and so forth. I understand that. As a matter of fact, you faced a couple of wildcats last uh, work study sessions because you were accused of undermining the Queen of Saanich. Did you undermine the Queen of Saanich? Not at all, Jack. We're well within the, re the uh, regulation. Actually, we're above the, regu the requirements. Uh, that was an unfortunate situation, certainly. Should have never happened. The only people that were hurt by that were a few of the traveling public and the people that were involved. We resolved the problem in an hour the next day. One question on the contract, uh, your notice to employees. This just baffles me. Employee assistance program. The employer has agreed to establish an employee assistance program. What is that? Well, as you know, uh, all uh, 
companies, corporations, what have you, have an increasing alcohol, drug uh, problem with employees, and we've agreed, certainly it didn't take too much convincing to, uh, to agreeing to establish a program which would assist these people and attempt to, to uh, rehabilitate them and uh, maintain their, their status in the community. So this is what it's all about. Only governments can really afford these kind of things off the top of their heads, though, can't they, Norm? Well, I think, every, I think it's important enough that everyone should be entering into that particular field. You, George Dobby quoted you in, a, in quite a dynamite statement last week, which I want to bring back to you again. This was after the study sessions. You said, what we have is an extension of the right to strike going back to the British style of trade unionism where any shop steward can take a shift out. Is that happening now? And did that happen? Do you believe from your knowledge, and you're a former union official, that a new breed has taken over and will deliberately disrupt the service on the British shop steward system? Well, Jack, I didn't make that statement off the top of my head. I gave it serious thought before making it. What, uh, and the reason I made it was because of, in the last few weeks, we've had four and, or five instances where the unions disclaimed any knowledge of, uh, of the happenings, Departure Bay, Horseshoe Bay, Dease Dock, uh, the last Sunday incident, the Queen of Saanich, they, uh, they say it's a local problem. Now, my understanding of the trade union movement is that uh, sometimes a, a controlled wildcat is necessary. But uh, where the union leaders don't have control of their members, we're slipping into a situation uh, which is, was very common in England and certainly was common in Canada in the postal system. Now, I'm concerned that if we don't, if I hadn't spoken out at that particular time, then this thing could accelerate and we could in fact be in that kind of a situation. And I don't think that anyone in the province, and I'm, I'm quite sure uh, this includes the big majority of union members in the ferry fleet want to get into that, time, that kind of confrontation situation where uh, every action creates a reaction, management has no uh, alternative but to retaliate, and you spend, uh, the only people that get rich are the lawyers because you spend half your time in front of the Labor Relations Board determining whether a person should be suspended, fired, Fair enough. and who's wrong. Norm, I must cut you off there just with one question. It's a bleak outlook and looks like a bad weekend. Well, certainly we hope not, but uh, who can tell? Norm Thomber, my thanks. Speaking to us from Czech TV Studios in Victoria, manager of labor relations for the BC Ferry Corporation. Thanks very much, Norm. You're welcome, Jack. <laughs>
uh, and another set of rules everywhere else. It's a dilemma for them, and their uh, immediate reaction is to withdraw, but we hope that they'll think that through and perhaps uh, uh, come back to fight another day in British Columbia. I can't resist a little gloat. I remember so well when you were in charge of the corporation saying how you're going to open up the industry, instead of which you have throttled it. Well, they've got to rethink their position, and you can determine this later on today. I don't see it's impossible for a private insur insurer to come in, but they've got to rethink their whole national policy, and in, in, in a worldwide outfit like the Royal Insurance isn't going to make an exception of British Columbia, right. not, not without some careful thought. And they may uh, reassess their position, and the government hopes they will, but we uh, can't see that. I'm sure happen. Mr. King will convince me, because I want to be convinced that your system is bad and unfair to me, which I know it to be. Well, it's based on experience rather than prediction. And uh, ever since the days of Lloyd's of London, traditional insurance is based on prediction. This is an entirely new concept, and uh, uh, it has to be tested by time. The government obviously thinks that it's going to be superior to what's been done in the past, but uh, only, uh, uh, only experience will establish. May I correct you slightly? May I say that the FAIR, F-A-I-R, premiums, are a direct result of the present paranoia about equal rights opportunities and anti-discrimination in every conceivable field. Sure, I think that's a fair, a fair, fair assessment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're not a psychiatrist, are you? No. <laughs> no way. Yeah. No You're way. still a doctor. Yes. Um, Discovery Foundation, your dream. Quoting from the prov province this morning, which is really quite generous to us. Do you remember the province? Remember it used to be a big newspaper? It hasn't always been that way, but I hope they've uh, gone on a new tack. Dr. Pat McGear's business-like science fiction dream is seen by some as an elitist boondoggle. Dr. McGear, I give you the floor and the cameras and your hands to tell us all about this Discovery Foundation, which, if I were a cynical person, looks like a device by which we can set up industrial plants of some kind on various campuses and feed opportunity to the entrepreneurs to develop industry. Now, you tell me, sir, what it is, and I shall attempt not to, to interrupt you. Well, if you examine the experience around the world since the Second World War, you find that those industries which have grown fastest in terms of employment have been the high technology industries. Those that haven't depended on trees or coal or any of the natural resources, but have depended only upon human ingenuity. Employment growth in such industries has been nine times faster than in the traditional industries. So we look down the road a little bit in British Columbia and say we want to give youngsters here an opportunity to live their lives in British Columbia and not have to move elsewhere, as in Scotland, Jack, or Ireland, or places where young people, if they're going to get a chance in life, have to leave their parents, their family, their tradition, and the place they love. If we're going to do that sort of thing in British Columbia, we've got to have a form of industry here that will give those opportunities. And we're not going to find sufficient in the resource industries. We've got to look to another direction. The high technology industries present the best option for us. It's something that we can do here, but we've got to set the ground rules so these industries will start in British Columbia rather than somewhere else in the world. And remember, we're pay playing a global game here. So we've taken the first steps in British Columbia to make this possible. We won't know for 10 or 15 years how successful it is, but we already know that it has started in British Columbia, that we've got viable high technology industries, that their opportunities for growth are much higher than their counterparts in the low technology fields, and therefore we're going to have some success here. The question is, will it be enough to provide the excitement and opportunity for all our young people that are coming along? You if that happens, they'll be able to look after us, uh, Jack, in our dotage, and we're not too far away from the days when somebody's going to have to provide for us. All right. At the moment, we have a number of organizations in British Columbia which are involved in research. We've got the BC Research Council. Is that no good to you? That's just a hardware vehicle offering a service to industry and government. It's not a growth industry in itself. It's, it's a service. It's something that right. can help others. You've got a science advisory committee to the cabinet or something like that. A science council. What's they're, that? They're there to explore and advise us about the fields that we should try and enter. And uh, you can put a scientist to work on a trivial 
problem. Or you can put them on to work, uh, put them to work on something like computers, where the sky is absolutely the limit. And so you've got to take your brains and have them addressed to those things that will produce okay, the greatest leverage. Okay, that's two bodies. The science Council is for that. You have a third body already. What is it? Discovery Foundation. No, no, there's another one as well. I thought there were well, four. Uh, well, we've got the Internal Advisory Committee of Government, which is just to make sure. And now you have Discovery Foundation, and you have convinced. This is the this is the one I'm going to get you yeah. explain in my simple terms. We'll bring you yeah. down from academia to the practical proposition. You've persuaded five institutions, <laughs> UBC, <laughs> Simon Fraser, PCIT, UVic, and the Oceanographic Research Institute to give you a total of 300 acres on their campuses as sites for scientific parks. That's correct. That's your first achievement. You've got 300 yeah. acres worth God knows how many million dollars which can be developed as scientific parks. That's correct. Without That's, any trouble, without uh, any cost to the taxpayer, none at all. None at all to the taxpayer. Now, uh, now you've got the, you're going to set up a non-profit foundation. It's established. And Called it, what? Discovery Foundation. Well, is it going to make profits or is it a tax losing proposition out of my hip pocket all the time? It'll make money. It, it will make money. What will happen to the profits? That will be divided between the universities and the science council. Don't they quite understand that. It'll make money and it'll be divided between universities will get the money for what? For scholarship, academic things? Oh, they'll get it to further their own activities, which are now totally financed by the government. So that the profits which go to the institutions are supporting activities which now are supported directly by the taxpayers. You know, universities only collect ten to fifteen percent of their costs in fees. The rest of uh, the activities of universities, one way or another, uh, Who's going to make the profits on the foundation grounds? Who will actually generate the money to make the profits? Entrepreneurs? Sure, because their success is going to be shared indirectly with all the people of British Columbia through jobs and general taxes that's, to government. That's what I want you to spell out for me because, you know... Well, when, suppose, let's take... No, not yet, please, Dr. McGeer. Yes. I'm in charge of this class. Right. After the break. Social Credit Government under the aegis of Dr. Pat McGeer, who is the Minister of Science as well as Education, is that right? Correct. Has set up this Discovery Foundation and five separate parks throughout the university campuses, etc., in British Columbia. And Dr. McGeer was just telling us that there will be non it will be a non-profit foundation, but it will make money. Shades of winner grin. <laughs> Let's take a park, say at UBC which is set up. Who's going to finance the construction of the plants? Who's going to have the right to work there? Who will make the money and how much of the profits will they give to the foundation? What kind of high technology work is practically envisaged in the near future? Okay, let's start with those uh, one by one. Right. The front-end money to prepare the ground and build the infrastructure will be Discovery Parks Incorporated, which is a subsidiary company of our newly established foundation. Right. People who will be permitted to establish in the parks will be those who are undertaking high technology research and development. Uh, those are industries that depend upon the kinds of technology that we support now in our universities, but up to date where we've had very little industrial payoff. Discovery Parks Incorporated will build the plants on mortgages against the land and lease them to firms. That's I correct. Correct. That's right. correct. Okay. Give me an example of a potential existing now. One of the uh, most exciting firms that we have in British Columbia is called McDonald Detwiller, which builds satellite tracking stations and sells them all around the world. Never so heard of them. Uh, they are, without question, the world's leaders. They do work for the uh, National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the United States. They sell tracking stations to Australia, to Brazil, to several other countries in the world. And the reason why they do it and nobody else is because they're smarter at it than anybody else. They've got better technology. Canadian uh, firm? Canadian firm. Uh, the reason why they're in British Columbia is because of McDonald and Detwiller, who like this place better than anywhere else in the world. They provide employment to several hundred people. Their sales are entirely offshore. They bring wealth, opportunity, careers to British Columbia, and they pay taxes. 
uh, their total output goes out uh, about once every four months in a set of crates. That's it. You could almost put them on one trailer truck. Several million dollars worth at a crack. So that's what high technology is about. Uh, no pollution, uh, no problems with the environment, um, no special trains required to move a lot of heavy material in and out, just a few packing cases every few weeks, worth millions of dollars. And those are transported to locations around the world where these satellite tracking stations are set up. What's the so this, will, this industry will grow. It will grow because the people at McDonald Detwiller know how to do this job far better than anyone else in the world, and because there's going to be increasing demand for these satellite tracking stations as more and more of them are put up. What can be done with satellites is just fantastic now compared with, uh, say, 20 years ago when there was nothing. All right. What's the incentive for McDonald Detwiller to locate, we'll say, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, in, at UBC Science Park? They've got to have the technology. The natural resources for firms like this aren't trees, coal, gas, oil, all the things that form our traditional industry. Uh, uh, it's brains. And the day some other firm can put together a team of people that can design better satellite stations, McDonald Detwiller is finished. So they can only succeed to the extent that they can bring along smarter engineers uh, and inventors than the next guy. So they've got to find that somewhere. Mm -hmm. and, and it's next to the talent banks at our universities that these people emerge. That's where the ideas come from. That's where the personnel that fuel these inventive industries emerge from. They're, that's where the natural resources. So you will reshape the curriculum at UBC if necessary in the science areas to lead people into this developing industry? That will be between the industry and between the all universities. Right. But I'll say this. Always in the past, if we have three vast chemistry departments as we have in British Columbia and a very small chemistry industry, all you're doing is educating people right. for the benefit of somebody else. It's That's a, a losing game. And what we want to do is to turn all of this around and say the money that we're spending will become a winning game for British Columbia because the taxpayer, instead of being net losers in this as they have been in the past, will be net gainers. Practical question. If uh, Arm McDonald Debt will have, for instance, committed to this? They've got their own plant out in Richmond. They don't need it. But, they're, but had this been available in their early phases, they would have got started sooner and they would have been able to grow Are they faster. going to move in there? Well, that's up to them. But they're going to be enticed, perhaps. They have, they have succeeded despite the climate in British Columbia. We're going to have firms that succeed here because of the climate. All right, now, it, take a firm like that, moves into your science park. You talk about a non-profit foundation, but making money. Sure. How do you get money back from them? Purely on the lease of the property and the conditions of the rental? They don't share the profits or anything like that. Well, it's not beyond Discovery Foundation's powers uh, to take a slice of the action of some of these new oh. firms that are coming down the road. Oh, but I'm not saying they're going to do that. No, but a new invention, they could take a piece of the action. Sure they Invest could. in it. Sure they could. From their money. Sure they could. Made out of their developments. Sure. Not taxpayers' funds. That's right. Oh, who's going to be on the board of this? The same old... So well, you credit names? Uh, we've got uh, some of the leading resource industrialists in British Columbia, some of the leading high technology presidents. We've got the presidents of the three universities and uh, a very outstanding representative from BCIT in Dave Brusson, who incidentally is starting the satellite uh, education program at that institution. Well, so we've taken all leaders. Cheap shot. Nobody from Trinity Western? Uh, not yet. Would you like us to have a park out there and put a chapel on the corner? <laughs> Listen, I remember going out doing open house last year and being terribly impressed by a scientist. Uh, I may not have his name right. It was either Rudy Salmon or Rudy Herring. Rudy Herring. He, I knew it was fishy. Yeah. Rudy Herring. Now, yeah. if his invention is true and he's got the patents, that's yeah. the greatest invention since the will. Tell the people. Well, he's uh, come across a battery that might make the electric car possible. There's an awfully long way to go to, 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 to translate this from the laboratory into something you could put in your vehicle. But up to now... Instead people, of gas. Yes. Up till now, people have never considered the electric car practical 
because the standard battery you have in your car just doesn't have enough oomph to do the job. Now, Rudy Herring has the basic patents on a process that might make this possible. Now, if you can develop your high technology so that you revolutionize the industry of the world, you've made it big. This mm -hmm. is what happened with Xerox. This is what happened with IBM and their computers. This and this is what has happened with the integrated circuits at Silicon Valley. Uh, and, and once you score uh, worldwide, once you, you literally hit one out of the world uh, ballpark in an industrial sense, then the wealth just descends on the area. And we'd like to have that happen in British Columbia so we can enjoy it for ourselves and share it with the world. But that's what the game is about. If you pull it off, it is a, a, a dream which one must regard as properly elitist. Have you pulled it off? Uh, only time will tell. I can assure you and the others that we're off to a faster start here in British Columbia than almost any other research parks that have been established around the world. But how fast we'll go uh, uh, from now on, uh, how big it will become for British Columbia, uh, that's in the lap of the scientists. I'm going to take one section of phone calls to Pat McGee this morning. They probably want to talk to you about the Lord's Prayer in Surrey, but that's beside the point. Uh, we don't use names, and uh, there was no advance notice you were coming on, so you can't have packed it with social credit flags, <laughs> unless Mr. <laughs> Kelly's within reach. But, but we'll take a section of calls. Don't you agree? Good idea? Yes, yes. You're in quite good form this morning. So are you. Is this your swan song? <laughs> oh, Jack, uh, when is your swan song going to be? Old age will be my swan song. <laughs> You're a man. That's, That's everybody's swan song. You're a man who wants to direct the great New Discovery Foundation. Oh, I think that we've got very, very capable people to do that. And uh, you want to get back to the whales? Uh, well, it's nice to do research. It's fun. Webster and Dr. Patrick Magia. After this break. I haven't directed people as to what they should say to you. We'll just take it cold. You're an old hand at this game. No matter who's before. calling. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Yes, Jack and yeah. Mr. McGear. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't take a, a great scientist to figure out how to bring some money into D.C. and without these uh, new developments. Now, you started out, I think the first statement you said this wasn't going to cost the taxpayer as a penny. There is nothing that government does that doesn't cost the taxpayer, number one. Number two, here we have a country full of natural resources. Uh, we've got iron ore that we're shipping out to other countries. And then, damn it, we're taking another natural resource, coal, so they can supply us with steel over in their country. Now, what is the matter with a darn good steel refinery in BC? Uh, nothing at all, except that if you've got uh, limited capital for investment, your best to put that capital into those things which will grow. Now, we had Lee Davenport speaking to us last Friday, who is the research director for General Telephone. He put on the desk a cable about that fat around. Uh, he just took a small length of it, which represents what goes under our streets to provide the telephone linkage from you into this studio. Then he took a fiber of glass, which you make from sand where the natural resources are worth no nothing, so thin you couldn't see it. You had to hang a quarter from the bottom to know that there was really something there, which carries 20 times as much information as this big copper cable. Now, you know what's going to go under the streets in the future to carry information between telephone exchanges. It's going to be little wee threads of glass. Now, which technology are you better to be in? making copper coils, or taking worthless sand and creating it into fiber optics? And the answer is there's going to be more growth and opportunity by getting into fiber optics research than there is to building a copper refinery. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do those things in British Columbia. I'm merely illustrating the contrast between high technology and low technology so that I can explain to you why it is the high technology industries are growing in employment nine times as fast overall in the last 20 or 30 years than the low technology industries. That's the Dr. difference. McGear. Dr. McGear. Hello? Yes, yes. Well, I'm right here. Well, listen, Dr. McGear. Now, you're talking about high technology and low technology. For years, we've been shipping all our ore out of this country. 
Now, right. I, I would like to see that little fiber wire build a building, build a battleship, build a, build a steamship. Okay, but people what are building but, those things where but one man... Not, uh, but, but you yourself are not buying uh, battleships uh, and steamships. We've got to have those things, but what you're buying is you're buying hand calculators, you're buying digital watches, you're buying transistor radios, you're buying superior Man. television sets, and in the future you will be buying dishes so that you can have satellite transmission delivered into your home. You'll be buying adjuncts to your television set so that you can get by computer banking transactions so that you can get information on what restaurants are open and all the things that new electronic technology is going to bring you as an individual. You'll still be talking about building a steel refinery in British Columbia while all your consumer savings and those of people all around the world will be going into the inventions that at the present time are being made in other parts of the world. I think we can end this here on the basis that there's room for both of you. Absolutely, and we're not discouraging resource development. We're saying that growth is in this area. That's why the government is behind it. Well, it was a political party that had a no-growth philosophy in British Columbia at one time, wasn't it? What one was that? <laughs> well, we won't go into that, but I will say this, uh, Jack. If you create 100,000 new average technology jobs in British Columbia, you're going to have 110,000 people come here to fill those jobs. And really, if we're going to bring great opportunity to our young people, and to everyone in British Columbia. We want to get jobs in this province that carry with them the most value to everybody per job because that's the way you build the infrastructure that permits us to have a rich hospital system, a rich educational system, and all the other things that people legitimately want in this Just province. Just to bring you down it's to value per job. You're terribly enthusiastic, but you've disappointed me. You didn't use the word you used on the telephone, that the infrastructure would also interdigitate. Ah, oh, you like that word. Huh, it's like disgusting. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hi, me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, given Dr. McGeer your emphasis on youth in the future, and given the great boon of technology, and given your statement of we're in the global game and global competition, and throwing in the fact that tuition only covers 10 and 15 percent of costs and so on, perhaps you could explain to me, as they pointed out very nicely on that W5 the other night, why are we educating so many foreign students in this country, especially when they're concentrated in the technological and science areas? And in fact, what we're doing is training our future competition at great cost to ourselves, both now in terms of Canadian tax dollars and in future potential loss of markets and jobs to these people we train. Well, uh... Do you admit the fact that many graduate seats are occupied, the majority at one time, 50-some per percent of graduate seats were occupied by non-Canadians. Do you admit that fact? Uh, we, high science, computer uh, sciences yeah. and so on. Uh, sure. Uh, we do a lot of trading around the world at the graduate level. And most universities, and I agree with this, regard their graduate schools not as a local resource, but as a national or international resource. And remember, much of the research that traditionally goes on in our graduate schools is funded from outside the province of British Columbia. And I'm sure that will continue. But this gentleman also ought to realize that we depend upon other places to provide us with our skilled people. And when you try and expand job opportunities in many of these areas in British Columbia, you run into tremendous resistance. I feel as keenly as somebody who made an effort to double the number of doctors who've been being produced in British Columbia and took a pretty solid cuffing around in the press for doing that. But here we have in our province uh, a system where we register about 400 doctors per year and we're still graduating uh, 80. less uh, 80. Uh, the people who will be future doctors in British Columbia are in high school uh, in Aberdeen or in London or in Taiwan or in uh, uh, Pakistan or somewhere other than in British Columbia because we refuse to develop the kinds of educational facilities in this province that will give our young people a chance. All across the specialty areas, whether it's computer science, whether it's heavy duty machinery, whether it's medicine, we are bringing in people from outside of British Columbia while we're denying educational opportunities to our young. Now you may say, how can the Minister of Education make statements of that kind? And I tell you, it's a very difficult thing for a Minister of Education, no matter how dedicated, to correct that kind of situation overnight. But I'll tell the gentlemen and all our listeners out here that we're a net gainer of other people's technology. Now, why we're trying particularly to reverse the thing as far as uh, uh, our science 
faculties is concerned, are concerned, is because this is the area that will bring us the fastest industrial growth. That's why it behooves us to work in this area it's now. It's a pity you, you solved the Discovery Foundation and couldn't whip the medical education into line, isn't it? Well, doctors don't like that much competition. When they, and I suppose that's understandable. Uh, but nevertheless, when you look to the future, our young people, our bright young people, are the ones who will make the best doctors in British Columbia. And I think it's wrong we're not training fully for our own needs. Well, I hope Rudy Herring makes a million dollars and a million jobs and uh, I can see there's also a little line in there you might be able to this is a great success to reduce the cost to taxpayer of university education is that right we can hope that Dr. Pat McGee next uh, serious interview with Fred King who is the BC branch manager of the Royal Insurance which as you know made a very serious announcement last week withdrawing uh, considering withdrawing from the automobile insurance market in British Columbia when they talked to Fred King without Dalton McGear after this break. You take too much of their business away from and that would seem to be the the uh, inference. Um, how long is it since they allowed you back in again? 1977. Yeah, I'm, I'm finished with that. That's, that's not good. Okay. Now, I'll, I'll take that if you've got it oh, made. 90, yes. Sure, good. 1975. 1977. 1975, we had discussions with government, and 77 is when it really started. numbers at the end of this break, Jack? We may well be taking calls on us. But we'll see. We may well be taking calls. So we should be looking at for it. I said to him, this non-discrimination thing is just the result of this paranoia over equal opportunity and whatnot. I'm about seven. I'm the Royal Insurance Company of Canada is, I am told, the largest insurer in Canada of homes, cars, and businesses. With me this morning is Fred J. King, the branch manager for British Columbia. And they made a public announcement last week, which I want to explore for our benefit on this particular program. Although it became obvious, even to an amateur like myself, that when the, that when the uh, BC government, but when ICBC brought in its so-called fair premium plan that the private companies were almost bound to be squeezed right out. Was my interpretation correct when the fair plan came in that you people thought, oh my God, what have they done now? Well, that's our interpretation, Mr. Webster, at this point in time. Uh, we, uh, we don't like the Bill 33 legislation in that it is a skeleton type of legislation. Uh, there are no regulations that we know of at the present time. Industry was not consulted. Uh, we've had no dialogue with government to date. We are continuing our op opportunities that are open to us to, to uh, try and talk to government so that we can, in some way or another, offer an equal opportunity for competition. Well, let's get a little bit of history. When the NDP came in, yeah. that finished private insurance in the province. When they introduced ICBC. Correct. Private automi automobile insurance yes. in the province, right? Then when social credit got back in again, I remember they said, we will open it up to private insurance. But they only did partially, am I correct? They only opened it up uh, for the excess of what we call the minimum liability limits, the public liability and property damage. Uh, the physical damage field was the open uh, part to us, and we immediately responded by taking the opportunity, and we were the first, as you said earlier, back in the business in British Columbia. We started out very small the first year, and uh, bit by bit we've uh, generated a great deal of interest. Uh, the uh, second year, we had uh, 12 or 13,000 clients. Uh, to date, in 1979, we have an excess of 55,000 new insured since March 1st of 1979. With a volume of what, potentially, in um, terms of money? It's in excess of five and a half million. It'll be probably $7 million by the time that we're finished in 1979. Now, let me get this clear. Were you, in fact, cutting into ICBC's business? Well, of course, we're, we were competing with ICBC. We had a better package. Uh, our coverage was enriched uh, with uh, uh, U-Drive cover. If you had an accident, we gave you a, a replacement vehicle uh, for an extended period of time, or a, a particular period of time, and also emergency road service. But the big thing is that uh, we're a private enterprise company, and we are the largest insurer in Canada, and we treat claimants as if they are somebody. We have adopted the speedy muffler approach in that a, the claimant and our insured is somebody, and uh, we don't like the government uh, monopolistic approach uh, uh, when, uh, <clears throat> when we've got into this particular situation. Okay, you're first back in again. How many other companies joined you in the field of competing for well, the optional coverage? Yeah. 
which it, people could buy from you because right. they had to buy the basic from ICBC. Right. Uh, the first year, I think there were just two of us. Uh, uh, this past year, we now have eight or nine. Uh, there may be ten on the business now. But uh, as far as the force goes, I would say that we have five very active uh, companies out there competing against ICBC for the business and also competing against us. Before we get confused about FAIR, uh, what they call FAIR, let me ask you quite specifically, what is the situation as of this moment with royal policy holders on their, not their home policies are still yes. untouched? on the automobile coverage? Well, any policy that is in force, of course, uh, will run its 12-month its term or whatever term the individual may have bought the coverage for. The uh, situation we have today is that we're not accepting any new business on a temporary basis. All our renewals uh, for the October business, I understand, has gone out. So by the end of this month, we hope that our dialogue with government will be finished and that we'll know where we're at. What we want to know from government is do they want competition, uh, and if they do, say so, and then let us compete on an equal and fair basis. That's all we ask. Now, let's talk about fair. Fair, I said to the Minister Adler, although he didn't come here to talk about insurance, I said to Minister Adler, fair was the result of what I regard as a bit of a paranoia about no discrimination and everything must be equal all across the board. Now, in this non-discriminatory policy plan of the ICBC, has that ever been done by an automobile insurer before? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. Webster. No way in the world. Not that I'm aware of. Um, what concerns uh, me as a citizen of British Columbia is and concerns you that this is something that apparently that's been put into play by our by our bureaucrats uh, without any consultation with the man on the street, without any consultation to consumer groups. Uh, there were no hearings and no briefs submitted. This was done on a unilateral action and we call it political pricing. Well, anti-discrimination, of course, is motherhood. You see, if you can say this wipes out discrimination, that's motherhood. Mm -hmm. But has it, what, how can you describe the government's new, ICB's new plan of fair? I have my own description, but how would you describe how it will work? Well, my understanding of how it will work uh, is that if uh, that there will be a flat rate for everybody. Everyone will pay the same rate. There will be no discrimination in, uh, insofar as age, sex, marital status, or territory, which means that a 65-year-old individual in Victoria will be paying the same price as one in Vancouver, even though we know that the accident involvement in Victoria, for example, is nowhere near as high or as frequent or as costly. Let me put that a little stronger. A 65-year-old guy in Victoria will be paying exactly the same as the 17-year-old hot rodder in Vancouver. That's correct. If they both start... They both start out, they both will start both out even in 19... When this program is put into play, uh, which is starting in 1980 in a five-year phase-in program, uh, that's, that's the concept. To begin with, there'll be no territorial uh, distinction, as I understand it. Uh, the, and, about, and if I have an accident under fair, what happens to me? Well, uh, shortly after the accident has been paid for by ICBC, you'll get a bill in the mail for $100. Right. And then you'll get two more bills on the anniversary date of the accident to remind you that you know you did get into some problems. So now you'll pay $300 for every accident uh, where there's a property damage claim. Supposing I have two accidents, so, so I get be, a second bill. That's right. You'll get, you'll get another account. And uh, this is the thing that concerns us is that ICBC at the present time, as we understand it, have accounts out there in excess of $20 million that haven't been collected already from other outstanding uh, items that are owed to them by way of people that have given uh, checks uh, that haven't been honored, uh, surcharges that haven't been paid. These uh, bills have been collected by the agents in this past, uh, past year, and I understand they collected several millions of dollars when you went along to pay your license plate. If you happen to owe uh, ICBC some money, they've got a book as high as that that uh, must be checked before they'll give you your license, uh, before your license is issued. One That's accident, a hundred bucks each year for three years. Correct. If we're supposing I have three accidents that year, I may just be having a bad year and not be a drunk and not be somebody terrible. So it'll be three hundred dollars a time. So I might be paying an, an extra. <laughs> in the third year, I'm paying nine hundred dollars extra. Yes, sir. That's my understanding. Isn't uh, that something like the private companies used to do in the old days when they used to uprate you? Well, we have a program in effect uh, now. I will, I'm sorry, sorry, Mr. King, I must take a break. Fred's making frantic signs after this break.
I've been discussing the decision of the Royal Insurance Company to go into a holding pattern at the moment on its coverage and offered coverage on automobile insurance in British Columbia because they feel that the ICBC step into a thing called FAIR makes it almost impossible for you to continue to do business. That's right, Mr. Webster. We were just talking a minute ago about uh, the uh, penalty of $100 per accident. At the present time, we have a rating system in play which uh, I would say is a substantial number of our insured, something like 80% enjoy a situation where if they do have an accident, there's no surcharge. In other words, we don't change your rate. You're in what we call our five-star program. You've proved yourself as being a good driver. You've taken driver training courses or you've been insured, not necessarily with us, for a period of time and you've established that you're a safe driver and that uh, you have the occasional fender bender. We say, that's fine, uh, that, that's to be expected, that comes out of our premium and we'll live with that. Uh, the thing that concerns uh, me is how are they going to collect this $100? Uh, uh, they'll be sending bills to everyone, but how are they going to do it? The suggestion was that they may even have to abrogate the five-year licensing system we now have and give you an annual license so that they'll be able to catch you because the $100 a bill that's coming to you is at the time uh, will be tied to your license, not when you go in March to buy your insurance or whenever you buy insurance from ICBC for your liability and property damage. This is a separate billing altogether. Penalty so, on the license. That's a penalty. No, it's not a penalty on the license. Right, they, it's a well, yes, yes, it is a penalty on the license in the sense that if you don't pay the $100, then of course you'll be walking. They'll pick up your license. That's the inference. But how are they going to collect this $100? You know, there, there's no mechanism that we know of at the present time to collect it. I was away when this was announced, but do the, does the points, uh, does the squaring of the points still apply on the license too? My understanding is that that is still uh, under under review. Uh, they have wiped out also the safe uh, driving uh, discount for these youngsters. That safe have, vehicle discount. Well, the, sa the safe vehicle discount. Safe driving, not safe. I'm wrong. I, I should say the driver training discount, oh, yeah. uh, which which the youngsters now can uh, obtain a substantial discount, so they can start out as they do in the private enterprise in the common law provinces, as we call it, where an individual that is taking taken a a, safe, a driving course starts out with a three-year claims-free record. He's proved himself, we say, by taking a course. He may spend a hundred dollars for the course, but the savings in premium, and he's establishing his own rate level. How about the safe vehicle discount? That safe would have vehicle to go. wheel, of course, that's gone. Uh, who cares, uh, as far as they're concerned, one accident, another hundred bucks. The other thing that worries me about this, and I'll put this to Mr. Sherrill or Sherrell when he's on next week, I know from experience in the good old days and with ICBC that the moment you put a penalty on an accident, the number of hit and runs will mushroom like an atomic cloud, won't it? Well, my understanding is this past year there was something like $10 million paid out by ICBC in hit and run accidents. Now, you can very well uh, see that uh, if a th we have a $300 deductible situation, because that's what it amounts to for property damage, three times 100, right. people aren't going to report uh, that they've scraped somebody in a parking lot. So there's going to be more demands on the hit and run fund. There's going to be less people reporting accidents, or you're going to have the situation where you'll be settling with your neighbor in the parking lot for a $50 or $100 claim because you know it's going to save you money, which in turn, I suppose, will reduce the, the, the payout that ICBC may have to make. Oh, yes, I'll have to settle a fender. Oh, well, by that time, scratching a fender will be $685. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, I'm afraid, is uh, inflation and the cost of repairs. Next now. question. Uh, Next uh, question. I'll put on my other hat now, and, and I shall say, tongue-in-cheek, that it is only fair, which is why they call it this, that everyone start out with the same basic premium. We'll say the premium might be, for the sake of argument, $500 a year per person, whether you're a 16-year-old boy with his first car or an 83-year-old guy with a dreadful driving record or a 25-year-old. Is it not possible for you, if you know the regulations, to come up with a competitive scheme just to put, the, to put them into a snit if for no other reason. Well, we have to compete on the basis of their regulations and the present act. And the way that the, the uh, present uh, legislation is drafted without any sort of recourse as far as we're concerned, we can't compete on that basis. Well, you mentioned a figure uh, for a start out of a premium. We say, fine, we can do that providing that that is statistically and actuarially generated. That's the whole difficulty that we have, is that we don't believe that their base is correct. Well, we, don't have, we don't have a $60 million subsidy to throw into the pot. They're starting out, you can appreciate, Dr. McGear was on the uh, previous interview, 
And my understanding was that when he was in Prince George, and when he was a minister that was responsible for the insurance corporation of British Columbia, and I choke on that word occasionally, uh, he was in Prince George talking to some high school students, and he said to them, and I believe this is documented, that for every dollar that we collect for people that are under age 25, we pay out $1.80. Now, where does that money come from? It comes from the $60 million stabilization fund if everybody's going to pay the same basic rate. We don't have access to that fund. We can't manipulate oh, our reserves uh, the way that they can. The point, the stabilization fund being from the reserves of ICBC to pick up the loss and the claims experience for the under 25. Uh, for, for the whole of the seg segment, because they're also territory, the little individual on Vancouver Island doesn't have the exposure to someone in a very large city like Vancouver. They Fred King, branch manager for BC of the Royal Insurance Company, and we'll be back with him after this break. Fred King, branch manager for BC of the Royal Insurance Company. Now, we'll accept, more or less, that there's a $60 million stabilization fund within the reserves of ICBC to pick up the loss on the under-25 drivers? For the whole of the uh, driving exercise they're now going into, which is age, sex, marital status, and territory. But the, the suggestion has been made that uh, the $60 million fund has been generated by these people who have been paying very high rates, the under 25 people. That's where the $60 million comes from. So it's only fair to put it back in there. Don't believe it. Well, of course, if they pay a dollar eighty out for every dollar they take in, that's a fallacy in that argument. All right. Uh, supposing, for instance, I were able to tell you, as the czar of Icky Bicky, that last year we paid out one billion two hundred and sixty six million in claims and that next year we're going to have eight hundred and forty two thousand people driving cars could you not divide that into that and come up with a flat rate for your system plus a penalty? Well, that's a very simple mathematical exercise, but what we would like to see and what we've asked uh, the minister and uh, the officials of ICBC to make available to us some statistics uh, so that uh, the present rate structure that is being uh, employed uh, can be statistically proved. They have not uh, made anything available to us, and they say that their statistics are, won't be made available to us at this point in time. All that we have is their annual statement. We have no statistics. The companies in, in, in Canada, by law, must report all their statistics by age and all the categories, the millions that we have of various, not millions, but hundreds that we have, to the superintendents of insurance. And from there comes an exhibit called the Green Book. Mm -hmm. We have the ICBC report to no one. They're masters onto their own. Uh, we know nothing how they run their business. We have no statistics available to us. Uh, all we see is an annual statement. Therefore, the, 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 your conclusion must be that when they brought in this Bill 33 on fare, the intent, knowingly, was to put you out of the automobile insurance business. Well, <laughs> it certainly seems that way, uh, Mr. Webster, and we thought that uh, we, could, uh, we could take a very soft approach and uh, say just quietly go away. Uh, we could outprice ourselves because that's what would happen, or we could uh, perhaps try and bring to the public of British Columbia our position because we think an alternative to any monopoly is good. When did uh, you say fair is coming in? My understanding is April, no, March 1st of 1980. So you won't know until the government announces it what their flat rate is going to be? Um, they may announce what their premiums uh, will be later on in the year. Well, we there's a five-year phase in. That's, that's going to right. be confusing. So, so it's going to take quite some time before we know what the rates will be. Now, am I not correct in, uh, say, a, a middle-aged man like myself, a mature with, individual uh, with a good driving record, my premium under fare is bound to go whammo up. Is that not correct? No, the government have said that they're going to maintain their present uh, rate level by using that $60 million surplus that they've built up. And we say, well, that's fine, but uh, can you statistically uh, demonstrate that that is going to be enough? Who knows whether that's going to be enough, but who cares? as far as they're concerned, because by the time they've spent the $60 million, we won't be in the business. There'll be no competition. Okay, as far as the Royal Insurance policyholders are now concerned with the situation, would you restate, for the benefit of, the, of your clients out there, where they now stand? Well, at the present time, we're not uh, underwriting any new business. Uh, the uh, October business that has been renewed, of course, uh, has been taken care of. Any contract that's in force, of course, will be honored the way that we have uh, uh, done uh, right from day one. Uh, our company, our very consumer-oriented uh, <coughs> company, we uh, were the first in Canada to bring in a plain language uh, 
form. Uh, we now have a plain language automobile policy before some of the superintendents of insurance. We have a lot of uh, things we think that are going for the private enterprise side and we want to be able to continue in business. But the fact is that you are not now writing any new policies. You're in a hold position to give full coverage for policies already in force and you're waiting for final talks with the government to see if there is a way where you can uh, statistically consider if it's worth doing anything at all. That's correct. Uh, we hope that by the end of this month the issue will be resolved. Well, you mean... In other words, we'll know where we're at by the end of this Who month. do you deal with? Do you deal with Shirelle or we, do you deal, we deal with the we, cabinet? We deal with the, the minister, Mrs. McCarthy, Gracie who is, we think is a very terrific person. Uh, she does Wonderful a very good job. Wonderful smile. Yes. Well, she's a very... Lovely hairdo. Uh, she's a very, uh, very good person, I think, for the province of British Columbia. Runs I don't nice think that she mentions that. I think she mentioned that she really doesn't know that much about insurance. <laughs> well, fancy that. Yeah. Uh, my thanks to Fred King, branch manager for British Columbia of the Royal Insurance Company. I'll be back. Are you ready now? Are you awake over there? After this break. <laughs> Class will come to order. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, tomorrow you have Vladimir Bukovsky, who is a Russian dissident. Oh, yeah, Interesting Vladimir, man. Um, matter of fact, met him last night, having a little get-together with him. And Vladimir Bukovsky, Russian dissident, will be here tomorrow morning. What else? Please read this tonight. Your guest tomorrow is Frederick Forsyth. Day of the Jackal. Great book. Mm -hmm. The plot to New assassinate uh, de Gaulle. This is the very bright, sharp, young English newspaper man, as I recall. Mm -hmm. Frederick Forsyth. Where's a deer stalker hat or something? Oh, that was a joke. Was oh, that a joke? <laughs> oh, I thought he was going to come in. Fred Forsyth. I'll skip read it tonight. How thick is that book? Take a shot of it. How long that will take me to read by Webster Speed Reading? 33 minutes, precisely. What else tomorrow morning? Oh, maybe an editorial off the top on something that may happen later yeah, on today. Yeah, not in a nasty mood this week. Tomorrow morning anyway. Oh, ferry workers, 9 a.m. precisely. <laughs>